Hi folks. To me, sociology class is not one of those places where memorizing little snippets of information is really helpful. I like for us in my classes to think about things more deeply and more meaningfully. However, having said that, the material that we learn on research methods and designs in particular really lends itself to memorizing in little snippets. There's really no other way to learn this material except by memorization. In this particular lecture, I want to concentrate on research methods only. I want you to remember that all sociological research is designed to measure four things. Attitudes, beliefs, feelings, and experiences. Good operationalizing is the key so that your reader can fully understand exactly what it is you've tried to measure. Now I want to go into a little bit of detail about these four different concepts. Attitudes formed from our past, our present, or our future, and formed as either positive or negative evaluations, meaning that I have a good attitude towards or I have a bad attitude towards. These are difficult measurements to get at. They are what we call arbitrary. They have to be measured against something else. So in other words, if I'm trying to gauge how much of a positive attitude you have, not only is it difficult for me to say the amount of positiveness you have towards something is similar to someone else's, I also have to make sure that when I talk to you about something being positive, I also explain to you why it might be negative so that you can make an assessment about how you feel about it. An example, if I want to measure your attitude about social inequality, then I also have to explain to you what social equality is. And that way I can get a clearer understanding of your particular attitude about inequality and likewise equality. Now one way that we can try to get an accurate measurement of an attitude is by using what we call a Likert scale. This is a Likert scale. You probably have seen these before. You may not have known the name. A Likert scale, named for the scientist who created this type of measurement. And let's talk about what this allows me to do. Let's say, for example, I want to get a measurement from 100 people that I have in a lecture hall. And I want to measure their attitude towards introductory sociology. Now, I could just ask, is your attitude positive or negative? And that would be a reasonable way for me to try to assess in a very quick way whether people feel good or bad about sociology. But I want a more nuanced measurement. And I want to see, do people have a really positive attitude or do people have a really negative attitude? And so I add some different measurements between those two extremes. And I ask people to circle where they're at on that line. This type of measurement allows me to zero in a little bit more carefully and delicately about the attitudes that people have towards sociology. So I may just want to know, is it good or is it bad? Is it positive or is it negative? But narrowing in allows me a finer representation of data. A Likert scale, really important. Beliefs. Beliefs are about your worldview. In other words, what do you believe? And they come from all the different things that we're told about, the ideas and ideals of a society coming down through fables and stories and, and traditions and superstitions and mythologies. And they become a moral foundation by which we act or think. Now, beliefs also influence our attitudes. For an example, we may have certain religious beliefs that shape our attitudes about religion, that shape our attitudes about politics, that shape our attitudes about the roles of men and women and children in society. This again is another one of those arbitrary measurements, meaning that I can't know how much of a belief you have unless I measure it against its opposing belief. Next, we talk about feelings. How do you feel about something? This is directly related to your life experience, meaning that most of the time when we're measuring a feeling, it relates to some experience that you may have already had or 
relates to whether or not you decide to have an experience in the future. And again, beliefs, our belief system helps us to form those feelings that we may have. Feelings are qualitative data, meaning that they describe us, they're descriptive data. They give a report on our sense of being. And again, these feelings measurements are arbitrary and it helps us to be able to measure them against the opposing feeling. Do you feel love or hate for fill in the blank? And again, we can use a Likert scale there to try to narrow in on those feelings a little bit more accurately. The fourth experiences, and here's the thing folks, experience requires action. So if you haven't done it, it is not an experience. And I'll give you an example here, the experience of childbirth. We can talk about it if we've never had a child. We can tell others what we've been told by people who have had children, but until we experience it, we cannot know exactly what it is like. And even within the realm of experiences, people have experiences that are vastly different from one another. And so again, this is another very difficult thing to try and measure. This is where operationalization comes into play, folks. You become really proficient as a researcher at painting that picture, knowing exactly what it is you're trying to measure. Is it an attitude? Is it a feeling? Is it a belief? Is it an experience? How am I going to measure it? What variables am I going to use? All of these things come into play when you do a research project with human subjects. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about the method and that comes after you've selected your design. Now you're going to choose from four different major research methods and they are surveys, existing sources research, which is also called secondary data analysis, experiments, or field research. And I need to take some time here to discuss each one of these with you in some detail. Now recall, Methods and designs are scientific procedures. We are always, always, always bound by science. And we're going to try to, when we select the methods and designs we're going to use and or techniques, we're going to try to maximize objectivity and minimize subjectivity. And we do that by following the scientific process or by following an interpretive framework. Scientific process, step by step, you don't go backwards, you're always going in the same direction. And the interpretive framework, which allows you to spiral around and adjust or add to or delete from your research framework so that you can better analyze those descriptive or narrative findings from your data collection process. All right, so we're gonna take these one at a time and we're going to talk about the positives and the negatives of each of these major methods. And it becomes your job as a researcher to know which of these methods is best going to fit my research and what are the drawbacks of selecting a particular method for my research. And we do that by talking to other sociologists, by doing good literature review, by seeing what's already out there about a particular topic and seeing how other people have researched it. You don't ever do research in a vacuum, folks. You're always going to want to toss around those ideas with other experts in the field. All right, so surveys are first. There are two ways that surveys can be administered. They can either be administered as questionnaires or they can be administered as interviews. All right, so let's talk about interviews first. Interviews happen face to face or they happen over the phone, but it happens when the researcher is actually talking to the research participant or subject. Now, what happens here in a very positive way is that you can get a lot of data aside from the questions that you're asking, especially 
if you're sitting face to face with a person because then you can start to read or gauge their body language. You can shift the way that you are asking a question to suit that particular interview. This helps you also to develop a rapport with a participant, particularly if you're going to have to have a series of interviews leading up to some more challenging questions. So you might come into that first interview asking some, some really benign types of questions, your age, your gender, um, where you grew up, how many siblings you have, etc. Those kinds of things to set a person at ease because really what you want to be asking them about, and by the time you get to your third interview, you can ask them about, for example, sexual activity. You wouldn't start right out asking those kinds of questions. So interview surveys can be very positive in that regard because they can help you to help a research participant let their guard down. One of the negatives here is that they are very costly and they're very time consuming. And because they can be difficult to aggregate, we generally hold off on doing interviews unless we have a very, very small group of subjects to interview. And I'll give you an example here for my dissertation research. I did do face-to-face -face interviews and it took me a long, long time to analyze that data. Each interview ran about an hour and then I had to have them professionally transcribed, which took a long time. I had to send them off to a professional transcription service. And then when I got them back, then I had to go through every one of them and read them to analyze them. This is what we call thematic content. It's not numerical, it doesn't have numerical values, and it's not statistically relevant. You don't express it in terms of a statistic. What we look for in this kind of data is similarities across responses to help us to develop some thematic codes within the data, and that can be really hard to do. So those are the positives and negatives to interviews. The other is questionnaires, and by far, this is the big hitter in the field of sociology. Most people will do questionnaire surveys when they conduct sociological research. Okay, so let's talk about some of the positives of questionnaires. They're quick, they're inexpensive, they're very easy to administer. Everybody has done a questionnaire survey, so we know how to do them. They are, in most cases, generalizable, meaning that as long as we observed the proper sampling techniques from our population frame, we can generalize those findings. And this gives us a lot of strength in that data because that data then applies to a broader population. Some of the negatives here, participation rates have dropped off tremendously in the last several decades. And there can be misinterpretation. Let's say, for example, you do an online survey or a mailed out survey and you answer questions a particular way. And I notice in your responses that they're not matching the expectation for that response. I can't necessarily follow up if that survey was done randomly. So if I don't have access to you to ask you whether or not you misinterpreted a question, this can skew my data. So I have to be very careful here about how I craft my questions and I have to make sure by deploying a survey prior to the actual survey and sampling a few people out of my population that I've done a good job of constructing those questions properly. So by far the survey questionnaire is the most popular research method that we have. However, uh, in recent years has dropped off in participation rates. All right, so our next major method is the experiment. And experiments are not necessarily the most popular for social science researchers. We'll talk about the reason why in a minute. We also have to bear in mind the Hawthorne effect when we do experiments. So with experiments, one of the positives is that we're able to gather very specific data because we can control the variables that you are exposed to. If we put you in a controlled environment, such as a laboratory setting, we can minimize the impact of other variables on you. That's also one of the negatives, that controlled environment, because it doesn't replicate reality. It's not a natural setting. And so can we say that the results we get 
from an experiment would be the same as the results we would get if you were out in the real world? And the answer to that is no, we cannot. You can think about a very famous experiment. Um, the Stanford Prison Experiment is a good example. Uh, another example would be the Milgram Shock Experiment. Can we say that those people would have behaved the same way if they were out in the real world? And the answer to that is no. We also have to worry about the ethical concerns of potentially psychologically or physically harming our research subjects. Finally, we also have to worry about the Hawthorne effect, and this comes with whether or not your research participant knows they are being monitored. And it comes from a very famous experiment done at the Hawthorne Electric Plant, where the researchers told the people who worked in the plant that they were being monitored for productivity and to go about their business. Well, what do you think happened? Of course, productivity increased. So with the Hawthorne effect, we always have this issue of telling the research participant too much information when they sign their informed consent form that allows them to then change their behavior to please the experimenter. So again, the main thing you have to remember about experiments for sociologists is they're not as popular as our other major research methods for these very reasons. And talking about experiments, I mentioned to you before the Milgram shock experiment. Uh, we have also used in psychology classes and sociology classes for years the Stanford Prison Experiment. Both of these caused great emotional distress to the research participants, and both of these resulted in the creation and use of the Institutional Review Board over time. Institutional Review Boards have now become part of every college and university that does research with human subjects. Our next major research method is field research, and we can do that in some different ways. We can do it covertly, we can do it overtly, we can do a case study, or we can do an ethnography. Covert field research means that we go essentially undercover. Nobody knows that we are researchers, and we embed ourselves in a natural setting and become part of a group. We observe them and we decide what we're going to report or write up about their behavior, their attitudes, their feelings, their experiences. The positive here is that you are out in the real world. You're in a natural setting and no one knows that you're a researcher so you can get people to, so to speak, let their guard down. One of the biggest problems here, however, is ethics. People don't know that you're a researcher. And in addition to that, sometimes you can be harmed. If your cover gets blown, let's say, for example, you were researching Hell's Angels or uh, a gang group and you embedded yourself within that group and then that group finds out who you are, that could have some really negative results for you. Overt field research, on the other hand, you're out in the open. People know that you are researching them. Again, one of the positives here is that you can be embedded with a group, but one of the negatives is a kind of Hawthorne effect. Now that group knows that you are a researcher watching their behavior. And so we have to guard against that behavior changing to give you the results that you want to get for your research. The case study. This is a particular person or a particular family or a particular classroom, and it really is only used when some other method of field research doesn't really work well for that particular project. And a positive here would be the depth of data that you get. You really get a fully global picture of that particular case study. However, you cannot generalize your findings. For example, let's say I was doing a case study on one family. Could I say that what I find about that family is going to be the same as another family down the street? The answer to that is absolutely not. And so my results when I do a case study are only relevant to that particular case study. Ethnographies. 
They are extremely costly, very time consuming. They can last for years at a time. Ethnographies are where you actually live with a group and you observe all aspects of their daily life and you do this for a long period of time. Your research is generally published in book form, you know, two to three hundred pages that describe every aspect of that particular group's social life. And one of the positives here is because you're studying a group for so long, they will let their guard down eventually, particularly if they really respect what you're doing as a researcher and they develop a rapport and start to trust you. You can uncover new things about that group that were previously not known in the research community. So let's talk a little bit about some interesting field research that has been conducted. Um, in 1970, there was a sociologist at the time he was a PhD candidate named Loud Humphreys, and he did a covert observation study called the Tea Room Trade, a study of homosexual encounters in public places. So Loud Humphreys did not seek consent. That necessarily was not a problem because this was a covert observation study he was able to visit a public bathroom in a park that was known to be a place where men had sex with each other. And he was able to, through watching their behaviors, perhaps sitting on a park bench close by, observe what was happening. And at some point he realized that there was always somebody playing the role of lookout. In other words, they always had somebody posted outside the bathroom. And when a couple of guys would go in to do what they were doing, uh, the lookout, if a cop came by or if somebody else seemed to be walking towards the restroom would knock three times on the door and then the people inside would know to finish up with what they were doing. Well, one day the lookout didn't show up and Humphreys was able to convince the people to let him be their lookout. And through that experience, he was able to gather additional data about exactly what was going on inside the bathroom. This piece of the research was not problematic. Where Loud Humphreys ran into problems was he took down the license plate numbers of these participants, and he had a friend of his at the local police station run the tag numbers and find out what their names and addresses were. And he went to their houses and he knocked on their doors and he was going to follow up with some additional questions and can you imagine his shock when he found out that many of his participants were living conventional lives with wives and children? This is where he crossed the line, following up by stealing their tag numbers, having a cop run them, finding out their addresses, and then going to their homes. This was problematic. He didn't know who these people were prior to that. Now he knew. And so he changed the conditions of the study by doing that, and it was a real problem um, in hindsight. So an interesting study, but again, one of those that could get you into trouble. Uh, in the 1990s, there was also a study done by a sociologist, Dr. Rick Scarce, and this was an overt observation study, and it was titled Eco Warriors Understanding the Radical Environmental Movement. Uh, and he was a sociologist who was working as, as a teacher at a university. And at this same university, there was a group called the Eco Warriors, a group of students who did not agree with doing any kind of research on laboratory animals. And so they were causing all kinds of disruption at the college. They were freeing the animals. They were uh, having protests, etc. And sociologist Rick Scarce wanted to find out about what they were doing. Nobody really knew who they were. They were doing all of their work very covertly. But Rick Scarce put the word out. He wanted to know who these people were, what their motivations were. And eventually, he was able to get introduced to members of the group. And so he knew who they were. At some point, he was asked to give the names of the people in the group to the college president, and he refused and it eventually went to court. And when it went to court, the judge asked for that information and he still refused to give it. And he was jailed for five months in 1996 because he refused to cooperate with that federal grand jury. But what he did when he said, I'm not giving you that information, is he upheld the ASA code of ethics, 
we have every right to safeguard our data. And imagine, had he given those names away, how that would have been a detriment to all future observation studies that were done because no one at that point then would be able to trust that sociologists would not give out the names of research participants. So a very important uh, field research study. There are all kinds of interesting case studies in field research, one specific person, situation, or condition, remember, uh, helpful when other methods are not applicable. However, we can't generalize these findings, and I use Dexter here as an example of why we can't generalize the findings. Lots of people have bad childhoods, but they don't end up being serial killers. So if we decided to do a case study of Dexter, those results that we published or wrote about would only be applicable to him and not other people who had a bad childhood. All right, our final type of research method is existing sources research, also called secondary data analysis. What we do here is that we don't collect our own data. We use data that was already collected in another data set to find out the answers to our own research questions. So using previously collected information to answer a new research question, our research question, the positive here, very cost effective. You don't have to worry about trying to figure out how you're going to afford to collect a bunch of data. You just use somebody else's data set. And it's also benign, meaning that there's no impact to the subjects. And so you don't have to worry about getting consent from a research participant here. The negatives, however, you might not have answers to the exact questions that you want to have answered. And the ability that's positive of being benign is also a negative. If you want to follow up, you don't have access to those research subjects because that data set comes to you without any identifying information. All you get is the responses and then your demographic characteristics that match up to that you can't go back and ask follow-up questions to people because you don't know their identity. This is, however, becoming a very popular type of sociological research because there are so many public data sets out there available to social science researchers today. All you have to do is get on the web and look for, for example, data sets for the census, data sets for the American Community Survey, data sets for the National Crime Victimization Survey, and so on and so forth. And they have a wealth of information in those data sets that is free for you to use as long as you know how to do that analysis. All right, a rather dry and boring lecture. Now we've covered the four major methods and the breakdowns within those. And we've talked about the positives and negatives of each of those types of methods. All right, let me know if you have any questions by using the general discussion forum or by emailing. Take care, bye-bye.